Thank you uh, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, uh, you felt it was too long. I thought it was too short. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, um, yeah, it's, I have a few points to kind of explore further. And is there something that you wanted to say, Devasmita, before you forget? You want to? Would you like to speak? Sure. Uh, uh, towards the end, you spoke about how high, high and deep is our spirituality. And uh, usually, we Indians are very religious. Mm. But, and for me, when we are spiritual, we grow towards a unity, harmony, without division. And why our politicians are making our India divided between, through the different religions? How do you say? Means they speak about, they are putting Sri on a pedestal, yeah. and yet, practically, they are not following what he wants, that we go beyond these uh, divisions of religions, and we come to something much higher than uh, what we are uh, doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, as they say, million dollar question or a billion dollar question. Uh, and it connects very well with your, how you started with the first uh, dream of Sri Aurobindo. So, uh, as Sri Aurobindo recognizes that for the large number of masses, it's still going to be religion that will give them the first um, approach to the spirit, right? Mother has said the age of religions is over. That is fundamentally true. And yet it is probably, you know, it's a truth of the future world or a subtle world which has yet to materialize in the reality in which we live today. Um, I will not touch about why politicians do that because I think there is a lot of uh, agenda there, you know, certain agendas that are at work there. But um, because Sri Aurobindo speaks very specifically of the communal division, the old communal division between Hindus and Muslims, which he says has now been um, come somewhat considered yes. settled with India and Pakistan. That, I think, was one fundamental uh, wrong decision that was taken to accept this. In fact, even before that, when you read Sri Aurobindo's writings in Bande Mataram, um, when this idea was floated about caste representation, and I'm still talking when India was not free, still under British rule, the, as a result of all the pleading by the then Congress, uh, certain things were given. One was that each caste would have a representation in um, the, whatever their committees, British people had, you know, the British Raj had created committees for the natives so that their voice will be represented. Sri Aurobindo objected to that. That caste-based representation, you are accepting the fact that only a person of my caste can represent my interest. Same thing he spoke about religion-based um, representation or uh, giving favors on the basis of which religious background. So this divide and rule policy that was very much agenda driven by the British, we somehow, our politicians of that time, somehow accepted that as a given. And the policies that were put in place from 1947 onwards were more about appeasing certain groups rather than looking at the needs of people as people, as human beings. Their needs or their shortcomings are not coming because of their religious background. But religion became the marker of one's identity. And policies were framed around that. Um, and that's, that has been continuing. So, it's, it's terrible. Why? Why we need to do that? We are first of all human beings, and if we touch a Muslim or a Christian or any religion, we'll have blood and bones and everything. So, how do you make such a big deal? Yeah, so uh, the thing is that uh, as I'm just going to take Sri Aurobindo's, uh, the way he explains in a much deeper way. 
He says harmony or unity cannot be there on the basis of falsehood. Some truth has to be established. Uh, even um, South Africa, when it went through its own turmoil, you know, they had to set up these truth and reconciliation. Come. So it's not the problem uh, that we don't have problems between Hindus and Muslims, but they have to be first dealt with in truth, not in appeasement, not in giving, you know, a little bit, like throw something out and keep them quiet, because it will stir up again. So uh, the whole thing about partition, why it was accepted that people of a certain religion cannot coexist in one nation under one government with people of another religion. Why it was accepted. That's what Sri says, it is a complete falsehood. This falsehood, Pakistan was born in falsehood and that's why it's always going to struggle to find its, not just nation soul, because soul does not exist in falsehood, even national identity. And we see this happening, right? Mm. So in some ways his first dream mm. has an answer to the inner conflict between Hindus and Muslims also. So Sri says this, I hope it is not considered as a settled fact. So a lot of it is like, you know, there is a lot of interference from Pakistani establishment in stirring up Indian Muslims. Um, but the enlightened Indian Muslim would always give allegiance to Bharat Bhumi as their, you know, as their Karma Bhumi and Dharma Bhumi and Punya Bhumi. But for a certain Muslim mind, that's not the case. So there are many layers to this thing. And all of this has to be discussed in truth. Mm. Yes. Uh, Ravi uh, guru was allowed. Allowed, absolutely. Yeah, if you have to comment that so yeah. that it's recorded, no otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, absolutely. I'll just if tell you. you uh, repeat the, yeah, question. Okay, so his her question was that in art, one can really transcend this. So like uh, yes. uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar's guru um, and so many other stories like that. The Hindustani music is a perfect example of bringing the two together. And there is actually a pretty... Cinema, um, Indian cinema is also... Indian cinema. Um, there is a video that has gone viral. Uh, Zakir Hussain, Ustad Zakir Hussain Khan, he's speaking about when he was born. The first words, you know, in Muslim families, the, um, the culture is that you have to speak some prayer in the ear of the newborn. And so his father, um, Allah Rakha, Ustad Allah Rukha comes and Kala comes and he plays rhythm and uh, his mother is angry. Why are you doing this? You are supposed to recite prayers in the new, be uh, new baby's ears. He says, these are, these are my prayers. I am a devotee of Saraswati. I am a devotee of Gan Lord Ganesha. This music is my prayer. Mm -hmm. So he says, music has a way to bring bridge cultures. So high art, any that common action that Lakshya you speak about, by practice of common action, unity can come about. So we are not confined in our, you know, identities in which we were born. The attempt has to, tran has to be about transcending that. Take mm -hmm. the truth and transcend. Okay. So I have a few other questions, but to, so because there is already a line of thought here. If I may add, uh, you spoke about the truth commissions in South mm -hmm. Africa, right? Uh, after independence, um, we never had any such truth commission, reconciliation mm. commission. So we, we just went about our life as if nothing happened. Yes. Um, so how did that affect the psyche of an Indian mind or Indian culture? Do you think it's high time even after, now last year he's, I mean our Prime Minister spoke about um, decolonization of mm. Indian minds. Mm. Um, it's, it's far beyond few, changing few chapters in no, it's, 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 yeah. it, the, the, the wound is deeper. Yes. And uh, the, the ointment cannot be superficial, no? True. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are again just coming from Sri and the mother, like, I don't know whether, I mean, I recently met with a couple of South African women uh, who came to Sri society and uh, we talked about this Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their opinion is, their view is also that it was much better on paper 
then on ground. Right. So still a lot of fissures exist, a lot of conflicts is, are there. And yet there is somehow, I, the fact that there is a commission like that, or there were attempts like that, um, I don't know the word is sponsored or at least encouraged by the state, says, it puts the right emphasis that it has to be, you know, a conversation in truth. Mm. It cannot be just, you know, band-aid kind of things, like what you're saying, removing chapters or mm. adding new things. Because often what the attempt is that, okay, you take, want to take out, if I can be just very candid, take out the chapters of Mughal history. Correct. And put in certain, you know, Shivaji. ancient Indian, yeah, Shivaji or Rana Pratap or things like that. That's not just going to cut it. It's like replacing one with the other. You have to put both of them in a context Correct. so that the person can see, the student can see where the two meet and what is true, what is falsehood. The other thing is that, which I think a lot of this kind of thing happened was to somehow keep the burden of the past onto the shoulders of the present generation. Right? So, uh, uh, today's Indian Muslim has nothing to do with what Aurangzeb did. And yet, by reminding him again and again that, you know, you are a descendant of that, you are actually creating division in his own mind, a conflict mm. in his own mind. So, today, if I have to meet with a person of a different faith, different background, I will meet with the person of today's time with his or her own mental emotional baggage rather than the baggage of the history, right? So uh, decolonization does not mean replacing one side of the history with the other. It means to actually give us tools to transcend the prison of the history. Mm. That's the phrase Mahabharat uses. History can be a prison also. Mm. So I think we have to keep remembering what Sri Aurobindo says, especially people who are drawn to his teachings, that we, are the, we have to look to the noons of the future. Keep the truth, but move beyond. Exactly. Right. That's the whole idea of this invocation, is to see how Sri Aurobindo's words can be used in a contemporary, understood in a contemporary sense. Yes. So you refer to something called age of revolt versus mm. age of harmony. Yeah. So what you are saying, even if it's an anti, say, past movement mm. to correct things, it's a, it's a form of revolt. Yes, you can say that. Yeah, it can be a first step, but it cannot be the final so step. So that's not harmonious in any way, because it will further create fissures instead of yes. it unity, has right? Yes, it, it can. Uh, and, uh, but as a corrective, it may be needed for a time. See, this harmony is not going to be created uh, in, isolation. in an isolation of the True. context. So if for 75, 76 years, and still, you know, moving further down past. If it's been there, it's going to take a long time mm. to nurse the wounds, if Correct. you will. Like you to said, to give a context and yes. put things in perspective, per se, yes. and leave it upon the intelligence on people, of people to make sense of what it is, right? Yes, I mean, yes. there is no one truth, as per se, anyway. Right, and so, and at the same time, I think that's where the um, new education policy and all these things come in so, become so important if they are done the right way. Right mm. now it's a more of a document. Mm. So there is no point discussing much of the worth of the document until it is implemented. Yes. And mm. um, teacher education, for example, how do you train teachers to encourage students to debate these points in a refined, mm. rational way, rather right. than taking things too personally? Going back to what Shurabindo said, he looked at William Archer's criticism, which was so, vitriolic and yet he found so much good to respond to yeah. by keeping his personal feelings aside. That's yeah. why I emphasize that point that you have to keep your personal prejudices aside to look at most uncomfortable things and work from there. So mm. a lot of it is psychological training. How do you train teachers to do that? At least the policy document that I have read doesn't talk about it. So there are gaps like that. We Correct. have a long way to go. So. Um, Sticking to the topic, rationalistic critique of Indian culture, uh, if we have to do that in present day's context, how well equipped are we to critique our own wrongs? It's, it's one thing to glorify all goods. Mm, mm. It's, it's wonderful, we can be proud of it, and we should be proud of it. Yeah. However, how do we look at the uh, ills and perils of our society, like 
corruption yes you know corruption which emerges out of the numbers that we have you know people vying for limited sources which kind yes. of you know instead of abundance we have scarcity and that induces corruption mm. and then there is nepotism and then there is this uh, you also alluded to appeasement mm. uh, for political reasons so how do we not make this as a norm of indian culture that you know like many people you know that you know if you have to get some things done pay under the table is a culture right 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 correct right yes so how do we i have we have become very comfortable with it no mm. like coming late is an indian culture we call no, it indian standard indian. time yeah so it, this has become a normal right. a new normal and how do we not make it acceptable by not doing it um i mean it has to start from the individual see these are the aspects of the body the way i mean when we i think that's where shrobindo's definition of culture becomes very important these are the problems in our outer material setup that we have created hmm. like not coming on time hmm. not waiting in proper queues i don't know i mean i just wonder why how come we are so <laughs> disciplined when we are at the airport waiting for security check in we do it in queues you go to any railway station it's all dhakka mukki everybody is like you know why yeah. is it we drive in lanes when we live go and you know live abroad but we don't do that here yeah. so it's the same person who will do you know very straight the metro is clean but the train is not exactly <laughs> you know even metro is often not oh, clean okay. <laughs> some places but uh, you'd go to kashmiri gate and yeah. you know uh, crowded places so yeah there is a number issue but these are the problems at the at the body level of culture mm. so i think from a shri aurobindonian point of view we could say that we individually first have to look at is my is the aim that i am putting for my life to grow in spirit if it is so can i start expressing that in the way i live my day to day life mm. and if giving a bribe under the table is not sitting right with my it's not a mental ideal but it's more of a my aim of life to grow inwardly if it is not sitting well i am not going to do that even if it means <clears throat> not getting the thing done or waiting for a long period of time so that has to be an individual decision making but we are also living in a collective hmm. collectively these have to be certain um, i think one of the things that is happening right now in india and i don't pay a lot of attention to day to day politics or anything or even like month to month politics <clears throat> but um, many of the things that have been done <clears throat> recently like with the digital economy or removal of the middleman so some of the things <clears throat> that were open venues for corruption will be taken care of in a period of time mm. like you know when you remove the middleman and you directly apply so i had to get my passport renewed actually new newly made um i took some help from somebody for whose uh, work i had to be somewhere but uh, and that person has influence and yet the process was very streamlined i filled up my application online i went to um, uh, the police check up you know the person was very cordial it all happened very smoothly and i've heard this from many people this is something few years back used to take a very very long time and a cumbersome process so many things are getting stre- streamlined because of the removal of the middlemen so collectively also i think it will take some time right but by some it's not like 10 15 years we are talking much longer phase than that so, so yeah by not accepting it individual at individual level first hmm. uh but again this cannot be just through a revolt right because that again can create whole other problem correct so so uh, in in the in the chapter judging a culture no you talked about three things you refer to sherbin those three points there uh, essence of the spiritual essence the best accomplishment of a society of a culture and the power of survival so uh, what if the third law is in is at odds with the second you know your best accomplishment can be had with say jugaad ah you get what i mean mm. so if jugaad becomes the culture uh, because anyway survival is the primary instinct somehow adapt renovate be alive no uh, but that's not culture 
No, no, no. I, I actually am not very fond of this term Jugaad. Yeah. And people who say that it's, you know, we should take pride in this ourselves being Jugaadu culture, I don't think it's something to be proud of. We have to, Ramayan Mahabharat, the best of our accomplishments, the best of our, uh, you know, the Brihadeshwara temple in Tanjavur or Gangai Konda Cholapulam, they were not Jugaad things. Correct. They were original works of massive, you know, Scale. done with massive knowledge, massive mm. scientific, industrial, literary, so many other things, you yes. know, went into it. Um, so, Ramayana is not just randomly mm. written, or Mahabharata is not just randomly yeah. putting, you know, stories together. Um, so, no, I don't think we have to encourage that Jugaru mind too much. Mm. Perhaps uh, but, the but enslavement... It was, probably, mm. it was probably necessary because we had... Um, we had some needs. I'm, I'm again talking like in a post-independence. Mm. Yeah. Huge number. Um, there was a time when India didn't have enough to even feed its people. We are coming from a history of famines and things like that. Yeah. So white revolution, all those things. I mean, green revolution, mm. all those things happened. Then white revolution with Professor Kurians, you know, the whole mm. Amul revolution and things like that. It was necessary. And yet time has also come to critically look at it. Because Green Revolution in its wake brought in a lot of problems with the um, seeds. Somebody like, you know, what Vandana Shiva is reminding us constantly right. through her work. So, you know, biodiversity has impact, been impacted a lot through the Green Revolution. So, in the wake of creating, doing that environmental necessity and using practical reason to solve the problems of the day, we probably have created more problems and which time is now to take a look at it mm. very critically. So we have to, I don't think that's, those are the best accomplishments Sri is referring to. <laughs> uh, anyway, we had to survive through a dark ages yes, and we yes. did. So this is something which it's more like a r r muscle memory that we still are continuing, mm. whereas the necessities of those uh, crushing circumstances have gone away. Yeah. We need not do that. Yes, correct? yes. So that's also is a, with the new renaissance, when you talk about the Indian culture, we need to remind ourselves that we are capable of a Bredishwar temple. Yes. And yes. not merely a Jugaad yes, yes. community, no? Right. So, I mean, I, my first visit to Matri Mandir was in 1990. There was no gold disc there, just concrete. And I was in awe of what I saw. And I had not seen Brihadeshwara or even uh, Mahabalipuram at that time. I just saw this is what Indians can do by bringing in the best of East and West, right? So this is where I think mother's work becomes so important in the yoga of the future mm. because mother brought in the best of the West and, and yet in her soul she was Indian. Sri Aurobindo in his own intellectual training brought the best of the West, and in his soul, he was entirely Indian, you see? So the future is not about living in two separate um, parts of the world. The future right. is harmony. integration, harmony. Correct. So uh, what we see in Auroville, the emphasis on outer beauty, the emphasis on outer organization. This is not Jugadu. This right. is all very new, mm. right? Bringing, giving a new form to what we were capable of doing earlier. So Absolutely. what we had in Mahabalipuram is the new form is Matri Mandir, the new cave of meditation or concentration, right? Correct. Uh, you spoke about uh, Sanskriti, mm. you know, uh, Sanskriti not meaning just culture, it also mm. means perfection. What do you think is the role of Prakriti in culture? So um, Prakriti, okay, they're in at least bringing Shurabindo's way of looking at it, he uses some words with the capital letter N, like nature as the capital N, or nature, no, our no. ordinary nature, right? So Prakriti with the capital N, nature. Uh, nature has to be mastered or conquered, but not in the sense of, um, you know. Enslaving it. Enslaving it, but rather as to make it a collaborator in creating a better world but better uh, future or a better world or a better humanity. So the powers of nature that have to be harnessed, whether it is wind energy, solar energy, again, so nature, by taking the gifts of the nature, you are creating 
um, something new. So, yeah, nature has to become a collaborator in creating that perfect society or the perfect world. It's not separate. Yeah, it's, it's not separate and yet it also cannot be... Um, because, see, the same Prakriti, in you and me, it also works through these, you know, what we call in Indian yogic thought as the sattva rajas tamas. So these things also have to be mastered. So those powers within us, those gunas within us also have to be harmonized and worked. So some, some of these movements of nature in us have to be conquered. Not enslaved, but conquered and uh, mastered in that sense. And um, you spoke about pursuit of perfection. And uh, while you define the culture in terms of uh, uh, soul, mind and body, uh, how would you look at it from the lens of ethical, intellectual and aesthetic sense? I mean, how, how would you look at that culture bringing in the intelligence, the scientific advancement, not yes. just art, you know, we usually confine ourselves to arts, right? Mm. But we do not look at the social, ethical uh, goods or in circumstances and intellectual, you know, far less emphasis. I mean, slowly we are waking up to the necessity of intelligence as yeah. part of Indian culture, which you refer to like rishis were scientists. They were, mm. they, they had this nice trinity in control of them. Mm. However, in today's world, that seems to be a separate stream. It's not a culture. It's as if the industrial world is some other commerce and no, it's... Yeah, yeah. How do the, we integrate it for no, a new Indian culture? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. And I think that's where... Um, so, it's a little bit of self-disclosure. I spend some time on social media just to kind of get a sense of where the young mind, Indian mind, I follow a few handles that are doing some very interesting creative things. So, I came across one woman uh, her, uh, she has a setup in somewhere in NCR, daily NCR. So what she does is she collect, and she has a team of people who collect old bottles, wine, whiskey, bottles. You know, in India we had this traditional uh, kabadi wala system. You know, people would give up their bottles. But this woman thought of a very interesting, and it's an industrial work. So they collect these bottles, they bring their to this this factory. It's a factory setup. Uh, and then they convert them into, and people tell them, you know, make glasses out of these bottles, or make flower vases, or con planters into these bottles. Okay. So they, she, she gives them some choices. And in a very industrial setup, they create these new things out of old alcohol or juice bottles. She's or employed, any other waste or any, ha. Huh? So she's employed, uh, I think, at least 100 or more than 100 people. And there is a whole delivery setup. Right now, it's only in Delhi NCR. And in her uh, Instagram handle, I was reading, people were asking her, can you do this in Jaipur? Can you send these things here? This is the new way of looking at perfection in the outer life, right? Creating something beautiful out of the old. This is just one example. There are many uh, examples like that. The other day, I came across another handle, um, Jini Chadariya. So what they are doing is they are going to Villages which used to have very strong weaving traditions, but due to the pressures of, you know, power loom and all that, the hand, hand weaving has gone. And this one example that this woman was giving, um, how these village weavers have relearned the art, and right now they don't have time to fulfill the orders that she's been able to get them. So, again, taking the ancient, uh, beautiful craft or you know, of particular, that particular kind of weaving, which was half tusser and half cotton, this particular, I'm forgetting the name of that mm -hmm. weave, but in a very industrial factory kind of, you know, mm -hmm. or a, you can call it like an outer life, yep. you know, the outer work, she's been able to bring that out. So it's not that it's not happening. Auroville, of course, is an example, you know, all kinds of industrial units, commercial units, they are working on the same idea. So, uh, it's not that this is not happening, we are just not often familiar with. Mm. What uh, I want to know is that, you know, the high science, the ah. patents, the number yes. of research papers, we do a fraction ah. of what Israel does for yes, that matter. Yes, 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 that know, is true. Uh, for 1.4 billion people. Yeah. So, uh, 
is it because we do not even recognize this as part of indian culture as if this is a, this has been outsourced to the west in a way ha uh, no i don't think um, well it was not the case we've just seen that yeah exactly it was so. not the case but if it has come to our understanding that's a problem we need to correct that uh, we have been more like what somebody says uh, the data provider and the theories will be made by the west <laughs> uh, or we will give them the menial labor yeah uh, and the patents will be you know held by the western scientists that has to change if that is still the case um, i don't know i'm not much familiar with the scientific research you mm. know the new things that are coming up but uh, certainly it should no longer be mm. we have to have uh, it's not enough to say you know google's uh, ceo is of indian origin or microsoft ceo we have to have our own google mm. we have to have our own microsoft you know so there is something i think that happened which from shurvindo's explanations of indian culture we can understand that at some point in our cultural evolution we began to give more importance to aesthetic turning of the right. mind and we thought less that this kind of outer work was less important yeah. and that probably the baggage of that is still there right we need to get rid of that um and as very rationally i'm saying you know this is our rational critique of our culture if we have somehow understood our culture as to be only about the inner perfection and not about outer perfection we need to change that super uh you spoke about this um you know east versus west and in general sense when we say east we consider indic thoughts mm -hmm. you know and when we say west we consider this far away as if it's in yeah. europe you know uh, however to my mind i think it's 50 50 within india oh more than that probably no because if if you do not just look at india as india it's a it's a cultural india which starts from afghanistan to say um uh, to um, burma mm. uh we have most populous pakistan and say bangladesh which are which follow an western thought abrahamic in a way uh, so there are a lot of dualities there which we need to somehow harmonize synthesize so there is this brahmanic versus abrahamic thought mm -hmm. uh, we have this uh, uh, you know unity versus uniform mm -hmm. kind of uh, thoughts mm -hmm. we have monotheism versus multitheism mm -hmm. uh and then we have various other such dualities which we need to overcome you no know, the individual versus collective uh how do you think we can find a modern india which unifies these two dualities which is very much part of i mean in terms of population also perhaps it's equal it's not often we consider west as a minority mm. if you consider yeah, it as yeah, 15 yeah. 16% yeah. for yeah. hindu majority right. however if you put this as a indic civilization it's equal it's 50 50 almost right right correct yeah very true so it's in a way like you said it's a it, this is a challenge however it's a it's a it's a great opportunity to use this um, to reverse the trend hmm. can we use this opportunity to reach out reverse the trend the trend that started to spread in a way we make it go the other way is it possible so, with a modern indian mind yeah so just one thing um, about the brahmanical thing in fact that's the term uh, and shobindo speaks about that since we are talk talking of this series of essays a rationalistic critique on indian culture there is one passage where he says that when the rationalistic mind says that india is a brahmanical civilization we need to understand what this brahmanical civilization is it is the civilization that puts the pursuit of brahman yeah, yeah, yeah. as the highest not the brahmin not the brahmin no, no, as no, no, that brahmin i didn't mean in that yeah, way right so we need to just kind of like have yes. it on record to say that correct uh i think if we were to actually make india again a brahmanical civilization in that sense of the word we can have many of these problems resolved by themselves because no matter whether one is um 
believing in polytheism or monotheism, whether you keep murtis of Ram, Krishna, Ganesh, Lakshmi on your altar, or you read Quran and uh, do not believe in any idol worship, if you think that by doing my five times prayer in a day, I am seeking that highest Brahman, and you do it with all sincerity, you can coexist with the one who has five Devi Devatas on her right. altar, right? Um, but the fact that somehow we thought that these two things cannot coexist, which is where Sri calls it clearly a falsehood, mm. because that is not a truth of the spirit. Mm. If the truth of the spirit was everybody, one, one way of seeking the divine, then why this whole diversity? Mm. See, in, um, as, a, as an Aurobindonian, we also look at how the problems begin. This is also a problem of the overmind. Mm. We are, because which is where multiplicity reigns. Supermind is that beyond. one truth, right? Mm. You know, that is beyond. That is where the oneness begins to come in. So, though the truth is, the highest truth is the Satchidananda, but that's the unknowable, the unthinkable. But supermind is where the oneness begins to flow in, mm. in manifestation, right? So supermind is this dynamic Satchidananda, if you call it. Mm. So one, now that that consciousness is working, mm. the way I see it, a lot of chaos that we are seeing it between Abrahamic versus non-Abrahamic, or in our own country, uniform civil code or no uniform civil code, you know, yeah. all kinds of things. This is just an outer working out of the inner mm. truth, uh, which will, and I, I don't even know whether, which side I'm on. I'm, mm. I haven't explored this in detail, whether uniform civil code will be good for India or not. I don't know, time will tell. Mm. But um, maybe for some short period of time, some uniformity might be necessary. As you read that um, first dream again, and you'll say, in whatever way unity comes about, it in must whatever yes. practical way, Correct. that must be the case. Right. So for a, some period of time, we may need some uniformity because we mm. are going with mm. you know, the times. Of, mm. We are still in the mental and over mental worlds. Yeah. But ultimately, if we hold on to that, mm. and again, I think for us Aurobindonians, we have to hold on to the truth. We have to choose that truth that has been given to us by yeah. Sri and the, and the mother, which is the truth of the supermind. So, which is what I guess Auroville was also trying to aspire towards. Right. That. I mean, when so. we are coming out of this old clutches and going towards a new India, yeah. I think Sri Aurobindo's India kind of takes more relevance. Yes, yes. Uh, when you say this as an, for to an Aurobindonian mind, there is no clash, no? Yes, um, yes. So. We just see it as like work in process, Pro work in progress. in progress. And I think it goes back to the same question. Um, the politicians, politics and finance, Sri Aurobindo said, would be the last two areas to be supramentalized. Mm -hmm. So the problems are more of the politics and finance, the whole economic chaos in the world. Right. You know, that's also the last to be touched. And again, we go back to mother's reminder that how would money be taken out from the Asuric forces and turned towards divine uses because she brings up that money cannot be, the money force cannot be conquered if you conquer another important mm. falsehood, which is sex. Mm. The, not just, you know, individual level, but at a collective level. Again, when you see this in the world, the, how the popular culture is promoting Portrayal. the unbridled pursuit of sensual satisfaction through all popular culture. That's where, you know, see all the money is the, the I mean, you see in Netflix all kinds of Correct. the weapons, the, the uh, woman, human trafficking yeah. for uh, sexual perversions and money. All these three forces, they are the three asuras that have to be conquered all at the same time. As mother says, to change anything, you have to change everything. Mm. Only super mind can do that. So we have to hold on to that mm. fast, this lifetime and next several lifetimes. <laughs> So, like you also referred to um, Sri Aurobindo referring often to the future, though he is 
he is invoking the past, he is reading the text, but he is talking about the future. Yeah. Uh, in this, what is, I, the way I see it, it's also like you also referred to religio, philosophical versus, you know, re practical reasoning mm. kind of world, the, the duality mm. there. Mm. Um, do you think there is a clash between intelligence and intuition? Uh, because yeah. future is all you do not know. It's an intuitive step. And intelligence is based on collecting evidence, the past trend, and you know, it's it's all about seeing the trajectory. Yes, so it's uh, a it's in a way uh, backward looking, and intuition is more forward looking. However, they both one is fed on the other. No. Uh, yeah. So intellect is, I mean, as Shrobindo gives you the gradations of the mind, intellect or reason comes with the mind. Beyond mind, first is the higher mind. That begins, that's the first opening to something beyond mind. Then comes the illumined and then comes, comes the in. intuitive. Hmm. So intuitive is still pretty high up. Okay. Uh, intuitive is where you begin to see flashes of truth that is yet to be unfolded. Hmm. So Shurabindo in his synthesis of yoga speaks about that all parts within us hmm. have their own intuitive faculty. So there is a physical intuition, there is a vital intuition, there is a mental intuition, and there is also an integral intuition. Mm. So that would be the true faculty to develop. And that is the faculty of the future. Mm. Um, you know, to be ready for the supramental world, to mm. be able to see truth. And even illumined mind, Shurabindo says, the best poets, the best artists often operate from that. They in, you know, they'll, they'll see some vision and they'll express it. I mean, Dev Smita would know. It mm. just happens. In life also, when you follow your first thought, which is intuitive, and then you use your mind, yeah. then goes wrong. Yes. It's very spontaneous and something very clear. Yes. You know, than the mind, which is reasoning. Right. So, and yet, there is this beauty in Sri Aurobindo that you cannot skip any stage. Mm. Some people, like, you know, with their prior preparation, like, Sri Ramakrishna, who did not have any formal mental intellectual training and yet he was living in that Brahmic consciousness. Uh, but for a majority of people, you have to go through these development of mind also. You cannot skip the stage of developing your reason and intellect. Because even the intuition to express that, hmm. you have to have the right faculty, you know, the right language. I mean, we are marveling at Sri in those words because he had that super brilliant intellect Correct. to express it, so. Right, I have so many questions to ask. Yeah. I've been told that the time yeah, is uh, yeah, getting been, over. It's so, become like a really long satsang <laughs> in those writings. Think, uh, yeah, perhaps we should, because I have, you know, a few things to uh, further lead our discussion on. Darshan was a very interesting, mm. Uh, notion also, the sh role of Shastras and revival of Shastras in a way. Mm. And, um, and you touched upon the invasion of material riches, which mm. is a Western, uh, has been the Western approach of the mm. few centuries. And how do we not follow that path, which we seem to have been walking on? Yeah, you well, know, and we have to invade culturally, <laughs> which yeah. is what the Indian way was. I mean, you know, we had up to the the Cambodia and Indonesia and, yep. you know. So, um, is there anything else? I mean, there are, finally, I would, if you can touch upon the challenges to Indian culture in contemporary sense, and then maybe we can. Yeah, I, I think just the one thing is that uh, when we are trying to go through this process of decolonization of mind and decolonization of, you know, like to kind of like start new, we are not starting new. India is not a new nation, Sri says. We are a very old civilization. But we have to always remember that we are not creating, recreating the old. This is what I see a lot of attempts today. Mm. Uh, those who are going through, who are talking a lot about decolonization or reviving uh, the past, whether it is, like for example, the form of Gurukul. Mm. We cannot be just living in an age uh, where there are just Vedic Gurukuls and then modern CBSE, ICSE schools, <laughs> right? So we have to create new gurukuls 
which is where the kind of integral education experiments that we see, yeah. whether it's in the ashram or Oroville, uh, you know, those are the new forms that we have to create. Mm. Uh, we cannot be looking, okay, so for example, um, this one thing that I really find so beautiful in Matri Mandir, the whole, the way the things are set up, there is Sri Aurobindo's symbol and there is very clear guidelines, no, um, you know, ritual, no pranam, nothing like that, you know, no outer expression. It's all about inner. This is where we are moving towards future. It's not about disrespecting the past. All the dhup agar bati was very important and I still do it because it helps me. But I do not have to claim that at a place which is meant to be for universal spirituality. So we are living in an age of universal spirituality. If some outer forms have to be given up, so be it. Whether it is from one community or the other, mm. right? So you cannot just say that I am to going to, you know, wear my kripan while going through, yeah. uh, you know, security, uh, security check. check in an airport because that is what my dharma says. But there are other, you know, problems that can come with it. Correct. So some outer forms, we need to be ready to give up. Mm. As Sri says, categorically, the caste system has to go. Is I do not, somebody asked him a question about widow, widow remarriage, some correspondent from Hindu. And he said, any form that came up in the time, any social cultural form that came up at the time when India was going through a period of decay, probably the time has to, uh, time has come to let go of that. Mm. Because what matters is not just whether you allow widow remarriage or this marriage or that or that, but whether women all women are given equal opportunity to blossom into their full individuality. Mm. So, outer forms are decided by policy makers, mm -hmm. but the inner truth has to be looked into it. Yeah, that is, that is what we have to hold on to. So, I think that's the new India. On that thought, thank you, Dr. Bilumera. Thanks, Thanks thank for the beautiful time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for indulging and asking such brilliant questions, really. Thank you for also not ducking it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. See you tomorrow, 10.30, with another session, uh, convention session on Invocation 2023. Thank you.